welcome to the 2019 FIRST Robotics Competition kickoff coming to you live from the home of FIRST in Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm Blair from FIRST Headquarters. And I'm DJ Knight, Twitch broadcaster. Thank you for joining us from one of 146 local kickoffs taking place around the world. You are part of over 3,700 teams all anxiously awaiting to see the challenges we have in store for you this season. Oh, and the challenge is right behind this drape. Now, I know that you at your local kickoffs are just as excited as our audience here in Manchester is. We've got teams here, sponsors here, friends of first, politicians. Are you ready? Are I'm you ready. ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> So DJ and I will be hosting the season liftoff from here at the launch desk and then later on that playing field. Ooh. So during this kickoff, we're going to invite you to ask your questions and comments in the Twitch chat at twitch.tv slash firstinspires. Here's how it's going to work out. After we launch the game and reveal the challenge in the game animation, we're going to head to the actual field where you can get an update on the kit of parts and the virtual field. And then we're going to play some field tour videos and then release the encryption code for the game manual and the virtual field. All right. Finally, we'll move into the last segment of the kickoff, which we are calling Deeper Space. <laughs> yeah. I like the sound of that. Deeper Space is where we're going to dive into the game by taking requests on some of the things that you want to see in regards to the field components and the interactions and answering your questions from the chat at twitch.tv slash firstinspires. Now, Deeper Space is optional, but we feel like you might want to stick around as we kind of show you the field up close and personal. It's the only field set up in the world right now. It's right there. So we are going to give you a long look at it, all right? And then, you know, then you can go off and brainstorm, design, build, a little robot to compete for the challenge. All right, now, kickoff is a huge deal at first, and we have a staff that has been working months and months and months preparing for today's liftoff. And right now, they're finalizing the launch sequence. So let's check in with First Mission Control and see what they're doing. This is First President Bosi conducting the launch status check at First HQ. All stations verify ready to resume count and ready to launch for the 2019 First Robotics Competition season. Destination Deep Space, presented by the Boeing Company. Payload Manager. The game is a go and ready for release on Planet Primus. Kickoff Sponsor, Rockwell Automation. Thanks, Don. As a strategic partner and kickoff sponsor, we're really excited for this launch. Let's check in with Sarah, who's a FIRST alum and a Rockwell Automation intern. Sarah. Oh, hey. Are you and the mentors ready to launch? Yeah, let's go uh, check on the team in the launch room. Rockwell Automation is super excited to be sponsoring this year's kickoff. I mean, I'm super excited to see what this new game is going to be. Globally, we sponsor over 200 teams in all four of the programs and mentor them. So. Let's go check on the team and see if they're ready to go. Rockwell Mason, we ready to launch? Yeah! <laughs> Engineering. The field is ready for play. We are a go. Game animation. It's ready for launch. We're a go. Kit of parts. Kit of parts. Ready for team distribution. We're good to go. Field tour video. The editing is finished. We're ready to upload. We are go. Strategic partner NASA. Primus Gravity Simulator is a go. Rover team is a go. Rover not is go. JSC Mission Control in Houston wishes you good, good luck. luck. Confirm. Many thanks for your continued support, NASA. Game manual. Manual is ready for delivery. It's a go. Virtual reality. Confirmed. 
VR is also ready for launch. Thank you. Alumni and scholarships. Alumni and scholarships reminding you to apply, apply, apply. And we're good to go. Copy that. Ops and team support. Team support is prepared to engage. We're ready to launch. Please verify status. Finance. Funds are secure. Go. Strategic sourcing. Sourcing is complete. We're go. Development. Boxes are ready. Good to go. IT. Code is clean. Go for launch. Dean. Good to go. Let's launch the season. Woody. How about the range weather? The weather is always good for first. Let's launch. Copy. The weather has no constraints for launch. First Robotics Competition Director Merrick, the Manchester launch team is ready to proceed. Please verify the field is ready for destination deep space season launch. Okay, thanks, Don. I copy. Season sponsor Boeing, please verify launch status. Hey, students and mentors. I would love to be with you personally uh, up there today. However, we're stuck in Houston doing this really cool thing called space flight training. Just earlier today, the crew and I were in this simulator behind me executing uh, one of our practice missions to get ready for our 2019 flight to the International Space Station on our return of Americans to low Earth orbit from U.S. soil. Watch, it's going to be extremely exciting. Hey, congratulations to you and good luck in the first robotic challenge this year. Destination Deep Space Challenge. We're counting on your innovative skills and the talents that you pick up as a part of working with a team to take us beyond low Earth orbit once again. Have fun, Boeing is go for liftoff. FTAs and field supervisors, please verify no constraints to launch. No constraints, FTA and field supervisors are ready for launch. Queuing and field reset. Queuing field reset crews are a go. And safety. Field and pits are safe to proceed. Judges and referees? Frank, on behalf of all judges and referees, we are ready for launch. Thank you. Awards? Awards are prepped for distribution. Scoring and webcast? Scoring and webcasts have no constraints for launch. We are, go. Copy, thank you. Pit admin and practice field? Launch director? Pit admin is not working on any issues at this time. Your go for launch. Field logistics? Fields are being packed or already on their way. We're a go. Copy. Machine shop and spare parts? Thank you. Destination Deep Space Game Announcers and MCs? It's showtime, Frank. MCs and Game Announcers are a go for launch. Thank you. CSA and Inspection? No constraints for launch. We're a go. Copy. Mentors? Yuppies and MCs are ready to launch! Okay, Don, the field is in great shape. All systems are go, the weather is go, the vectors look ideal for launch. On behalf of the Manchester crew, a big thank you to all the volunteers around the world helping us deploy the next great mission. The launch team and I wish you all good luck. Copy that. Thanks, volunteers, for fueling our mission. We couldn't do it without you. And thanks to the whole launch team here in Manchester. I know how hard you've all worked this season getting this mission ready to launch. It's time to light them up and give them a show. We are clear to launch Destination Deep Space. For all personnel, the countdown clock is now live at T minus four minutes and 30 seconds. All systems are go. Okay, we're just under four minutes and 30 seconds to launch. Weather is clear here in Manchester, we are ready. So, but before we do that, let's send it over to DJ, who's standing by with one of our mission specialists. So joining me now is the father of gracious professionalism himself, Woody Flowers, with some thoughts on this upcoming season. DJ, this is, hold is a great opportunity to offer some timely advice. Buckle up, firsters. It's going to be a wild ride getting into deep, to deep space. Now, I hope all of you have heard Dean came and say, this will be the hardest fun you've ever had. And he's talking about much more. But let's start by talking about fun. You will have fun. It will be quite intense fun. And it will mount and become joy. Joy will happen when, when your team says thank you, when your robot actually works. And as, <laughs> as joy builds, before long, you'll experience some happiness. And happiness is really nice. It's a big deal. Your family will see you laugh. They'll also see you grimace some because of this hard, fun stuff. But it's really good. That builds and finally starts to become satisfaction. Now, satisfaction is really good stuff. We humans love that feeling. It's a big deal. But an even bigger deal is having a meaningful life. So. Getting a meaningful life is really up at the top in the hierarchy of good stuff. It means you feel needed and loved. You might even find some contentment. Now, I can't promise that all this will happen when you build a robot with your friends and it will give you a meaningful life, but I can promise that if you do all this 
in the spirit of gracious professionalism, you'll have a really good shot at it. And maybe in six or eight weeks, you'll have a little more of that much cherished stuff called rational self-esteem. But it will be hard fun. Buckle up, firsters. It's going to be a wild ride. Thank you very much, sir. Inspiring as always. Thank you very much. Now, guys, we're going to head back to Blair at the, at the mission control desk. Thanks, DJ. And thank you, Woody. Now, we just got word there's a slight hold for the launch, but there was some sort of water leakage from this year's game. But <laughs> we'll get that mopped up. And while we're cleaning that up, I have got another mission specialist here. In fact, we wouldn't be here because he created the first mission. Please welcome first founder, Dean Kamen. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. So, Dean, th this year we have a theme, and the theme is space. Now, I understand you sort of came up with that theme based on a conversation you were having with uh, one Buzz Aldrin. As you know, as you know, the word inspiration is in our name. We're about inspiring people to recognize science and technology. I grew up in a generation that was inspired by the space race, inspired by the capability that in 1962, when the president said we will, in this decade, use technology to put a man on a moon and bring him safely back. I think that motivated a generation. The current generation needs to be even more motivated. And on the 50th anniversary of putting a man on the moon, I think it, it just seemed totally appropriate to just look back at that, but not sit on our laurels and look back. It was to remind ourselves that when you get people organized and motivated by a competition, by the aspiration, by moving when no one had ever been before, you can do incredible things. And now we've got to motivate an entire new generation to bring the world to a place that your grandparents couldn't have imagined. So now let's tie together that mission, that Apollo mission, go to the moon, to the first mission. How do they connect? Well, while I, I say we're motivated and why I say that it's, it's great history to look at and give us confidence of what's doable, I think maybe the difference between technology and the arts, you know, literature, is the arts have classics. We look back at Shakespeare or Rembrandt, but in science and technology, we look forward. We're not here to talk about what we did 50 years ago. We're here to motivate you to do something over your next decade. We're here to make sure that you people have the tools, cure cancer, build clean energy supplies, make water and food and cybersecurity available worldwide, make the world a better place, a healthier place. And I think if FIRST stays uh, motivated, to inspire kids around the world, if FIRST can continue to have its mentors, its role models from now more than 3,700 major corporate sponsors and a couple of hundred universities, we will bring more kids to be more motivated to do what this world desperately needs, apply technologies in the right way to solve critical problems from which we all will benefit. And hopefully we will keep humanity staying at least one step ahead of whatever is the potential catastrophe that will overrun us if we don't master technology and deploy it responsibly. And I think this country has demonstrated, at least throughout my lifetime, that we know how to develop technology, and more importantly, we know how to appropriately deploy it. And so it is critically important to hear to the people and to the world that we maintain this kind of focus and energy and leadership looking forward. Use, use this 50-year-old example of what can be done by people that cooperate, what, what NASA was able to do, but use it as a historical reference and move forward. Technology is about leaping forward at an accelerating rate to tackle the problems that we all need solved. And I, I personally believe, uh, no matter how crummy the 
the news tends to be, the one place that you can go and come away recharged and energized is to a first events. You see kids that have unbridled enthusiasm, unlimited imagination, cooperating and communicating with adults and experts in a way that it just makes life exciting. And I'm hoping that this, this first phenomena continues to grow at the rate it's been growing. In fact, I'm never satisfied. I'd like this first community to really get louder and louder and louder around this country and around the world and, and, and be a beacon for all that are cynical or all that are skeptical or all that are downtrodden by the typical news we hear, bring them to a first event and you'll change their attitude. You'll change what they believe is possible for people that know how to communicate and cooperate and make the world a better place. That's our mission and this example of, of in, in my lifetime putting a person on the moon you all ought to ask yourselves, in 50 years, what are you going to be looking back at? I was your age, student, when we put a person on the moon. What are you going to be looking back at when you're my age saying, we did that? It's going to be way more spectacular than putting a human being on the moon. I don't know what she will have accomplished, but it will be extraordinary. And you people right now should commit yourselves to creating that incredibly exciting future for all of us to look back at, and I hope to be with us. We'll make a few organs in there. <laughs> I'll be here 50 years from now helping you celebrate what your generation has done. All right, well. I think with the energy here at our local kickoff, the energy of FIRST around the world, and the motivation of our students, I think that it's pretty much a done deal. And 50 years from now, they're going to make you proud. Dean Kamen, everybody. And coincidentally, I just received word that the hold is lifted <laughs> over at the launch pad. So let's send it back to Mission Control. Ground launch sequencer is go for auto sequence start. Launch in remote sites, we are T minus 25 seconds and counting. Destination deep space is a go for launch. Planet Primus, here we come. Activate launch pad expression system. In other words, it's time to make some noise and count it down with me around the world. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. We have liftoff of destination deep space. Welcome to the 2019 First Row Robotics Competition and this year's game, Destination Deep Space, presented by the Boeing Company. Two alliances of deep space travelers race to place hatch panels on their rockets and cargo ship, load valuable cargo for transport off the planet, and return to the safety of their habitat, all before the next sandstorm sweeps through. Each alliance has two rockets, one cargo ship, and a habitat. Hatch panels and cargo are available through the human player stations, and cargo is also available in the depots adjacent to the habitats. Robots start in their habitat and may be preloaded with one game piece. Alliances may also choose to preload some bays of their cargo ship with either hatch panels or cargo. 
During the first 15 seconds of each match, driver vision of the field will be blocked by a waning sandstorm. So robots must be controlled using either autonomous code or manually with a vision system on the robot. Alliances earn points for exiting the habitat, securing hatch panels, and any cargo that's properly stored. Cargo not secured spills from the cargo ship. As the sandstorm ends, driver vision returns, and alliances continue to earn points by loading their spacecraft. Alliances earn a rank point during qualifying matches for completing one rocket with hatch panels and cargo. Near the end of the match, robots return to the safety of their habitat for the upcoming launch and to earn more points. The alliance that earns the most points wins the match. All right. So here we are standing on planet Primus, and it's pretty cool, huh, DJ? It is in the sandstorms. I really like the idea of the sandstorms. Well, the sandstorm is kind of a twist on the autonomous period. And I know someone who's very familiar with Planet Primus. Let's send it over to FIRST Robotics Competition Director, Frank Merrick. Thanks. Thanks, Blair. We are, we are so excited for Planet Primus. We're so excited for this game. I can't wait to see what we're also excited for all the wonderful sponsorship we've had this year. So uh, let me introduce, once again, Jay Flores from Rockwell Automation, our kickoff sponsor. And on this side, we have Tony Castellea from the Boeing Company, our season sponsor. So Tony, Boeing's been doing wonderful things for us for many years. You really decided to, to step it up this year and become a season sponsor. It's great for FIRST, it's great for the teams, but what's in it for Boeing? Well, the future of space is being built right now at Boeing. We are launching the Boeing Starliner to the International Space Station. We are building the Space Launch System, which will take us faster and further in deep space than ever before in our lifetime. And we're learning the technologies for deep space exploration. So it's the right time to work in deep space. It's the right time to go build these rockets and spacecrafts. And it's the right time for FIRST to be in deep space. Fantastic. So you've got some exciting launches coming up. That is right. You saw Commander Chris Ferguson in the video earlier today. We'll be launching him this year. We'll have our uncrewed flight test in March with the Boeing Starliner and then our crewed flight test with Chris Ferguson launching in August to the International Space Station. We're going to unlock our own hatch to the International Space Station. Oh, so exciting. I'll tell you, Boeing's been a great sponsor for us for teams, for events, and now you're stepping up for the uh, whole season. Long-term sponsors. Speaking of long-term sponsors, Jay Flores from Rockwell Automation, our kickoff sponsor once again this year. Same question to you. You've made a big investment in FIRST. Why does Rockwell Automation do that? Yeah, we're proud to be a strategic partner and excited about being this, this event sponsor for this year for the kickoff. And it's a big opportunity for us to have our products on the field and students' experience is created because of that and students are using our products on their robots so it's building the future talent that's going to be great for us for our customers for the rest of the world but also I think the secret is the benefit to our mentors and the, me the benefit that our mentors then provide onto the students it helps engage our mentors uh, they're excited to work for Rockwell because of what we do and uh, Tony was actually a mentor of mine when I was growing up so I know the importance of having someone like that so thank you to all of our mentors for all that they do and we hope that you really enjoy this season. Thanks so much, Jay. Thanks, uh, Tony, as well, for everything you do. How about a big round of applause for Rockwell Automation and the Boeing Company? I also want to do a shout out to National Instruments. National Instruments is such a vital part of everything we do here. Thank you, National Instruments. I want to go ahead and say good luck to all the teams. We've got a really exciting, I think, game for you this year, especially good luck to the 436 rookies. That's 436 rookies around the world. It's, as uh, we've got a, you've got a, you're in for a, a wild ride, just as uh, Woody said. One more thing before we go, before I go, I want to say we always say it every year. It's absolutely true. Nothing you are doing in first is worth getting hurt over. Please be safe out there. Be safe traveling to and from at events. Be safe traveling with your robots. We don't want anyone getting hurt. Thanks, everyone. I can't wait to see all the robots. Well, there's going to be some great events. Thanks so much.
All right, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thanks to all our sponsors. Now, we've seen the game animation. We've taken a high-level look at the game. Now it's time to get a bit more specific and dive into this field a little bit, which means the entertaining and informative field tour videos. Now, we know you may have a lot of questions about this, so if, whether you're on the front page of Twitch or you're already there at twitch.tv slash firstinspires, make sure to put your questions in the chat, and we'll get to them after we check out these videos. And remember, all the answers are in the game manual, which we will unlock in just a bit. Dimensions, rules, they're all there. Read the manual. We'll say it over and over again. But first, let's get to our first field tour package. We've got the Alliance Station, the Sandstorm, and the Loading Station. And then we'll be back here on the field to talk about the kit of parts and the virtual field. Enjoy the videos. Hey, everyone. I'm Amanda, and this is Matt. We're here to talk about the Alliance Station and Destination Deep Space. The Alliance Station is the area behind the Alliance Wall where drive teams play the game. It has three player stations, each adjacent to each other. At each end is a loading station. Watch Alex and Jasmine's video to learn more about those. Each player station has a shelf for an operator console. Note the strip of two inch wide loop tape. So you want to have hook on your operator console. Use it to help prevent your console from sliding around or worse, off the shelf. Each player station has an ethernet cable which connects the operator console's computer to the field management system. The e-stop button on the shelf lets you disable your robot if necessary. There's also an AC outlet for your operator console with a two amp fuse. If you find yourself in the middle player station, watch out for the equipment under the shelf. Notice the stack lights above each player station. They relay information to the teams and field crew for quick diagnostics. Check out the game manual for full details on these indicators. Each player station also has a team sign that displays the team number throughout the match. The official time remaining in the match is also displayed on an additional signs hung in player station two, and they are marked with white tape along the bottom edge. Behind the alliance wall are game piece holders. Hatch panels are stored at the rear of the alliance station, and cargo are stored behind the loading stations. Also take special notice that the lines on the floor of the alliance station are different this year. Starting lines run perpendicular to the alliance wall. They separate the driver stations from the loading stations. Drive teams must stay between these lines during sandstorms. No leaning or peeking over them. Sandstorm? Wait a minute, I can believe lasers, but you don't really expect me to believe you're gonna get a sandstorm out here. It's true, Jasmine, but you're gonna have to watch Danny and Ted's video on the sandstorm to learn more about that. Anyway, good luck out there. Hi everyone, I'm Danny. And I'm Ted. We are here to tell you about the sandstorm. The sandstorm period is a new concept this year and represents the first 15 seconds of the match. That's right, in Destination Deep Space, there's no specifically dedicated autonomous period. Instead, driver visibility will be blocked by the sandstorm for the first 15 seconds. Teams can still choose to program their robots autonomously, or they can operate robots using onboard vision systems. Prior to the start of the match, but after all the robots are connected to the field, the sandstorm will be lowered to completely cover the field side of the player station transparent panels. It will remain lowered through the sandstorm period. At the end of the sandstorm period, the sandstorm will be raised. This will take approximately two seconds. We ask you all to take special note, however, that starting this season, we're asking teams and field staff to no longer bang on the player station windows. We ask this not just for the safety of teams, but also the safety of the equipment mounted on the player station walls. This includes during team introductions, during match play, and any other time you feel like giving the field a well-deserved high five. We know robots are going to use the wall for what it was designed for, and we now ask teams to do the same. Really? Thanks, Danny Downer. Well, at least we get to see some new and innovative ways teams are going to use to show spirit during team introductions. That is true. Good luck, teams. Hi, I'm Alex, and this is Jasmine. We're going to tell you about the loading station, which is where human players deliver hatch panels and cargo to robots on the field. There's a loading station at each end of each alliance wall. Each loading station has three vertical openings on the field side of the station. The top one is square and is where cargo enters the field. A drive team member feeds the cargo from the Alliance side through a chute. There is no door on the chute, so cargo put in the chute heads right through to the field. Humans, check the manual for rules about keeping body parts out of the chute. The middle opening is where hatch panels enter the field. Human players place the panels into the circular slot. 
and the panel falls down through the station and is caught by pins and held in place by brushes. Once settled, the hatch panel is at the same level as the hatches on the cargo ship and the lower hatches on the rockets. When placing panels in the loading station, be careful to ensure there isn't already a panel in the station, as two panels in the station may cause it to jam. Also be aware that cargo that ends up in front of the loading station may make it difficult to remove the panels. Speaking of retrieving hatch panels, check out the backstops on the top and bottom of the hatches. These backstops mirror what's on the cargo ship and will limit the reachable depth of the hatch in these areas to about three inches. The bottom opening in the loading station makes room for robot bumpers, just like on the cargo ship. These openings are positioned so there's space, get it, like the theme, <laughs> for robot bumpers in the Alliance station. Did you just come up with that or did you plan it? I apologize. Anyway, back to the bumpers. Don't worry, there's a metal guard behind each opening to keep humans from contact by the robots. Good luck, everyone. Hope your season is out of this world. All right. Lots of great information in those videos, and they will all be posted on the first YouTube channel at the end of our webcast here. Joining me now to talk about the kit of parts in the virtual field is kit of parts manager, Kate Pilot. Welcome, Kate. Happy kickoff. Thank you, Blair. Happy kickoff. Yes, kickoff is always exciting because we find out the game, but we're also pretty excited because teams get their kickoff kits today. So I know there's a lot of new stuff every year. Is there anything you want to talk about? Yeah, so the kits this year, of course, have game pieces. So teams are going to get their own cargo, their own hatch panels. Um, so you get those today. Uh, also, there's some kind of robot basics in there, but also some more interesting items. And that's always fun to see what teams do with the more the odder items. So what are you holding in your hand there? So teams may want to open their kits and pull out their Siemens cardboard viewer. Um, as we've blogged about so far this season, there are some VR and different ways to view the field this year. And so with the viewer and with the assets that are now going to be released, now that kickoff is happening, uh, you can see the field for yourself. Um, and there are some other great ways to see the field up there too. So check it out. It's on the playing field page. Now, the kickoff kits aren't the only news in the kit of parts world, right? What else is going That's on? That's right. So kickoff is also when we launch first choice round two. So you have until January 10th to secure your uh, priority list for round two. So make sure you get that done. I know it, there's a lot to do, but that's important. Um, and then also on the uh, virtual kit page, on the kit of parts page, we've added some new items to the virtual kit. So don't check out, don't forget to check out that free stuff as well. Okay. All great stuff. Don't go very far because you're going to be on the field answering questions in just a little bit. But before we get to that, let's show we've got the cargo ship in the Rockwell Automation Field Tour videos. Roll them. Hello, everyone. I'm Chuck, and this is Jamie. We're going to tell you about the cargo ships. There's one cargo ship per alliance. They're centered on the field back to back with a bit of a gap between them. A cargo ship has eight bays, three on each side and two on the front facing its alliance station. Each bay has a hatch where hatch panels are placed to secure the cargo. There is a strip of hook tape on each side of the hatch to retain hatch panels. Before the match, each team can choose if they want to put null hatch panels on their two designated bays or leave the cargo pre-staged by default. The bay floors retain cargo until the end of the sandstorm when they tilt and any unsecured cargo rolls out. The back of the bay has a cargo net that holds the cargo in the bay. It's pulled tight, but it does have a little give to it. You'll also notice three small posts arranged vertically between the hatches. They prevent a hatch panel from spanning two hatches. Also, check out the backstops above and below the hatches. These prevent hatch panels from accidentally going inside the hatch while they're being placed. Take note, however, that this limits the reachable depth of the hatch in these areas to about three inches. And notice the recess around the entire bottom of the cargo ship. Conveniently, it allows for bumper clearance, allowing a robot to interact with the cargo ship using parts inside its frame perimeter. Be sure to check out the game manual for more details about the bumper clearance on the cargo ship. Alex, what are you doing? I'm just trying to see how much cargo I can get off Primus. It's quite a bit, actually. Yes, more than one cargo can fit in a bay, but only one is scored, so there's really no need to put any more in there. Anyway, each bay has a vision target. Be sure to watch the vision targets video with Danny and Amanda for more information on them. The electronics in the cargo ship are legit industrial, 
donated by our friends at Rockwell Automation. Be sure to watch the Rockwell Automation video with Matt, Alex, and Amanda to learn more. Power and signal cables connect that hardware up to the field management system at the scoring table. These cables are covered by cable protectors, which run between the cargo ships to the guardrail in front of the scoring table. Be sure to check out the game manual for more information about the cable protectors used this year. Good luck, everyone. See you on the field. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt. We're back again this year to talk about the Rockwell Automation electronic components on the field that control the sandstorm and keep track of what's happening with the cargo ship and with the rockets. Every team will get a chance in an Alliance station, so that's a great place to start. Alex, what can you tell us about the equipment they'll see? Thanks, Amanda. Each Alliance station includes a Station Control Cabinet, or SCC, in Player Station 2. It includes an Armor Block Input-Output Module for controlling the sandstorm, the LED-pendant lights, and tells the field when an e-stop is pushed. The SCC also has components to send power and data to the team number signs and acts as the Ethernet interface between the scoring table and each team's operator console in the Alliance station. Details on the software side of the SCC and how it operates with the rest of the field management system can be found in the FMS white paper. Cool stuff, Matt. Let's check in with Jay Flores, Global STEM Ambassador at Rockwell Automation, before we check out the rest of the field. What's up, STEM Squad? I'm here at Rockwell Automation headquarters where we're excited about expanding human possibility. You've seen it in the first robotics competition field where every year the challenge gets more and more exciting. And that's powered by Rockwell Automation products, just like the ones here at the Academy of Advanced Manufacturing. You may have also used some of our products on your robots, which allow it to do more and more complex tasks. So I want you all to remember that FIRST is a sport in which all of you can go pro. And if you can find the STEM behind what you're already passionate about, we can expand human possibility together. The cargo ship also uses an Ethernet-enabled armor block module housed inside a small enclosure we call the Auxiliary SCC and connects into the field via Ethernet. The armor block module controls the electromagnets, which hold the bay floors in place during the sandstorm, and operates the light, which indicates when the magnets are on. Thanks, Alex. Amanda, what can you tell us about those touchscreens? Thanks, Matt. The touchscreens are placed around the field and operated by the official scorers and referees to keep track of the starting location of robots, panels and balls that are scored on the rockets and cargo ships, as well as any fouls. Those panels have been around for a while, haven't they? They have. They've proven to be super versatile. We started using them in 2011 to score all the game pieces in Logo Motion, and they become our go-to solution for the referees to enter fouls and score robot actions like scaling the tower in Stronghold or facing the boss in Power Up. The ACC looks familiar as well. Good eyes, Alex. We used those in the scale last year. With 40 sets of playing field equipment, it's really helpful to be able to reuse hardware. Recycle. Perfect. In the meantime, teams, be sure to check out all the Rockwell sensors on First Choice. There's proximity and limit switches, as well as two different kinds of photo sensors that can be employed in all sorts of different ways. Good luck. Okay, a lot more good information, but there's so much more. Not everything can fit inside of these game, and game videos. So here with me now is Danny from the game design team. That's right, DJ. There's so much in these videos, but the videos are really just a good introduction to the game. The game manual is really where you're going to find everything. Now understand, we broke a lot of, hey, we've always done it this way, assumptions in the game manual and in this game this year. So it's very important to approach that game manual with an open mind. Like, how many defenders can I have on each side of the field? How many different ways are there to score ranking points? These are a lot of really good questions that need to be answered, and they're all in the game manual, I promise. Now, the fun part about that is that there's a little bit more coming as far as these videos are concerned. So we've got one more video to show you on the rocket, the vision targets, and the HAM platform. Hey, it's Malcolm. Ted and I get to talk to you about the rockets. Hey, everyone. Malcolm, I'm so glad we get to do this video together. I know we're going to rock it. I'm going to ignore that. Come on, that was some great comet tea. Each alliance has two rockets on their half of the field. Each rocket has three levels and a nose cone. Be careful of the rocket fins when designing your robots. Each level of the rocket is made up of two cargo bays for storing cargo. Cargo is entered through the base through a circular port on the front face of the rocket. Each bay has a hatch associated with it, which is located on the sides of the rocket. The hatch is a circular opening with hook side fastener on the left and right sides and openings on the top and bottom. Hatch panels attach to the hatches using hook and loop tape. 
Loop tape is on the edges of the hatch panel, which attaches to the rocket. At the top of each rocket hatch is a single upper backstop. The inside of the rocket level has two angled ramps which direct cargo towards hatches. Cargo placed into a port may roll to either side of the rocket. Covering both hatches will guarantee that cargo stays inside the bay. Hey, guess how many I can fit? Oh yes, it's true that more than one cargo can fit in each bay. But like the cargo ship, only one cargo per bay counts. If you've seen how scoring works already, you know that the team earns a ranking point for completing one of their rockets. That means six hatch panels and six cargo. One per bay, of course. It doesn't matter which of the two rockets gets completed. Hmm, what if I do half of each rocket? One half plus one half equals one, right? Your math is right, but partial rockets that add up to one complete rocket does not make a ranking point. Once you complete a rocket, the nose cone of the rocket will light up in the color of your lines. Let's take a look at the bottom of the rocket. Notice anything? Unlike the loading station and the cargo ship, rockets don't have bumper recesses, and each hatch doesn't have a lower backstop. There are similarities, though. The height of the bottom two hatches is the same as the hatches on the cargo ship and the hatch panel retrieval height at the loading station. There's also a thin steel plate at the base of the rocket. Make sure your robot can handle this. The rocket has vision targets, too. Be sure to watch Amanda and Danny in the vision target video to get the details. Good luck. We'll see you out in the field. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the vision target video. I'm Danny, and I'm here with Amanda. Hi, everybody. There are two deliberate sensing aids on the field this year to help a robot see where it is. Reflective tape on field elements and gaffer's tape on the carpet. Let's start with the gaffer's tape on the carpet called alignment lines. You'll notice there are a lot of short white tape lines. Every location where a game piece is expected to be retrieved or placed has an alignment line to help guide a robot. Each rocket has three lines, each cargo ship has eight lines, and each loading station has one line for a total of 32 lines on the field. Lengths vary, but they're applied such that they start 18 inches from the hatch or port face and continue to the point where the field element meets the carpet. But wait, there's more. Each cargo ship, rocket, and loading station has vision targets. A vision target consists of two angled strips of retro reflective tape. The tape is angled so that a vision tracking system doesn't get confused if more than one target is in the field of view. On the rocket, there's a vision target on the front face just above the lowest port and a vision target on each side face just above the lowest hatches. On the cargo ship and loading station, there's a vision target just above each hatch. But remember, the rocket has three levels on it, but only the hatches and port on the lowest level have vision targets above them. Robots are just going to have to figure out where the rest of the hatches are based on those vision targets. Thanks, Danny Downer. Good luck, teams. Hello, everyone. I'm Jasmine, and this is Malcolm. We're here to tell you all about the HAB platform. The Habitat platform consists of four decks and a ramp. The four decks are on three different levels. Level one is three inches high off the carpet and includes a ramp leading up to it. There are two level two decks both are nine inches above the carpet, or six inches above level one. The level three deck is one foot, 10 inches above the carpet, or 13 inches above level two. Wow, we sure have a lot of decks. Please stop. <laughs> Sorry, I deck line your request. Anyway, the ramps are at a 15 degree angle and surround the level one deck on three sides. The surface of the decks and the ramp are half-inch textured HDPE sheets in each alliance color. Both HAB platforms have depots at each end. This is where six cargo are staged before the match. The depots are bound by rails, which are steel barriers that are attached to the carpet using hook and loop fastener. Hmm, where will the robots start? Great question. Teams choose if they want their robots to start from level one or level two. Be sure to read the manual to learn about specific robot placements at the start of the match. Robots climb up the platform at the end of the match too, right? That's awesome. I think we'll see some nail biters there. Check the manual about height restrictions though. Any robot in the HAB zone can't ever reach above their Alliance Station wall. Good luck teams. See you at the competitions. All right. Some great information and some bad puns. We are gonna wrap up here and 
go to our deeper space segment where we will go much deeper onto the field. We'll show some field interactions as well. But first, it's just about time to reveal the code. And after we reveal the game code and the virtual field manual, we'll wrap the credits here. And we'll come back here for the deeper space segment of the kickoff. See you here in a minute. frame for a second, then we'll open up. All right, we are back on Planet Primus, and I'm here with some of the game design committee. We have Kate here, Kate Pilot, Malcolm Strickland, and Danny Diaz over there with DJ. And now we are going to answer your questions coming in from the Twitch chat room. The first one is for Kate and Malcolm. It is from Bunny Warlord DX. How exactly does the hatch panel fit on the ship chassis? I'll move out of the way. All right, good question. So the hatch panels have loop tape around the outside, and they have hook tape on the outside of where they sit. So this is a null panel. We'll get to that in a little bit. But basically, hook and loop, and it sticks. That's, it's as simple as that. All right, our next question is for DJ over there with Danny. It's 190. It says, can you try to make the ball come out of the loader quickly? Hey, that's a great question. I'm so glad that you actually asked that. Because we did do a small redesign to the, the loading yeah. chute from what was inside the actual yeah. uh, field tour videos. And the redesign, not really redesign, it was the modification, yeah. was to make this the angle Where? of this ramp here on the chute How a little more aggressive to allow the balls to come out a little more predictable. So Malcolm's going to go ahead and give us He's going to go ahead and give us a few balls coming through the chute so we can actually see how they land and their, their behavior inside the chute. So here's one ball. Notice that the ball spends some time inside the chute actually bouncing around. Here you go. All right, here comes another one. And it comes out slow and predictable. And there it comes out again. One more time. Comes out, slow and predictable. All right, thanks, Malcolm. All right. All right. Our, our, next, our next question is from 6Michael2442. How many hatch panels does a team have to place to stop the cargo from falling out? All right, so the ratio is one to one. For every ball, or I'm sorry, cargo, that you want to keep in your ship, you need to place a hatch panel. So ideally, you probably want to place a hatch panel first so that when you do deliver a ball, Malcolm's got a piece of cargo for me, when you put a ball in the rocket or any other bay, either cargo ship or rocket ship, that the cargo stays inside the bay because you have the hatch panel in front first. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. No panel, the ball probably won't stay in your waste in your time. All right. We've got a next question from Duke of Wool who asks, only three ranking points per match? 
Okay, that's a great question, and that's where I was trying to allude to a little bit in the, the section about the game manual. There's actually a maximum total of four ranking points per match. Now, of course, you know the usuals. You get uh, one ranking point for a tie. You get two ranking points for a win. There's also a single ranking point that you can earn for your first completed rocket or a completed rocket on the field. And of course, your, your light above your rocket will actually turn on once you complete the rocket. That's one point. There's also a ranking point for climbing. So there's certain points associated with each level at the end of the match for climbing up onto the platform. If you score 15 or more climbing points, you get a ranking point for climbing. So there's a total maximum of four ranking points this year per match. Very nice. All right. Next, we're here with Malcolm, who's going to talk about the null hatch panels. Thanks, Blair. The null panel is different than the regular hatch panels. As you can see, there's two different hardware sets onto, onto the panel located at the top and bottom. The bottom, two brackets and the top, two latches. The null panel attaches to the cargo ship pre-match, just like this. I don't know. I guess. So this ensures so the null panel does not fall off during play, and you can secure, those, um, secure that panel. Okay, here's a question that's come in from the only warlord. Can't the hatches get stuck to the floor because it is carpet? Good question. We actually thought about that during game design, and that's why we put the loop tape on the hatch panels and the, or, I'm sorry, yeah, the loop tape on the hatch panels and the hook tape on the, uh, on the, hatch pan on the hatches themselves because loop doesn't stick to carpet like the, like the hook tape would. All right, DJ. Is from Electro Red Stoner asking, can you push the cargo through the hatch openings? Hey, that's a great question. We, we actually have nothing in the rules right now that actually prohibits pushing a cargo through the hatch opening. You can uh, on the rocket and the cargo ship. Uh, you could even do it out here. There's there's no current rules that say you cannot. Indeed. Unless you want to actually see it done, <laughs> which is really the purpose of this uh, this session here. But yes, you can, there's no rules against it. All right. All right, the next question, Malcolm, we can move around the field, is does it matter which way the hatch panel goes on? Great question, Blair. As you can see, there is loop tape that goes all the way around the um, circumference of the hatch panel. And you can place it that way or that way. It's both sides, so. Make, make sure your designs of your robots c comply to that. Well, that's a great question. All right, so we got next question from Evie Tail. During the sandstorm, is the human player station window covered? Hey, that's a great question here. So is the, right now you can see that the sandstorm actually covers the player stations, but not the human player station. Now inside the field tour video for the Alliance Station, you'll notice that there's white lines inside the Alliance Station. You're not allowed to even peek over that line. You're not allowed to peek at the field at all uh, through the, the loading station. So while there's no sandstorm covering the loading stations, there's not allowed to be anybody actually in this area or even peeking over and looking through this area. All right, we're back on camera. We've got another question. This one is coming in from Heptadeca. Does the cargo ship platform stay angled outward after the sandstorm period, or does it return to its normal position? Good question. It stays angled outward. So the ramp that's in the bottom of each cargo ship bay after the sandstorm tilts so that the ball can roll out, and it doesn't return for the rest of the match. So unless you put a panel there, your ball won't stay, your cargo won't stay in there. All right, all right. Next question is from at 830. And they ask, will the sandstorm drop at the start of the match or when the field is match ready? That's another great question. The field actually, when it's match ready, 
the field reset personnel will actually lower the sandstorm blinds. So after all of the field introductions are done, after the robots have linked up, and when the match is ready to start, we're going to come out, lower the blinds, and then the match will actually start once the, the MC and everyone's ready to start the match. All right, our next question. Do the top ports on the rocket have vision targets? So the rocket does have vision targets, but notice they are only at the bottom of the rocket. These are located here. The top, as you can see, and each other level of subsiding does not have vision tape. So plan your robot design and your camera placement accordingly. Also, on the other side, on port, we have vision tape on this side. It is also on the bottom only. Yeah, it's still completing both same, rockets. Same rules apply. Okay, okay. All right, and the next question is from Lorelei. Does completing both rockets get you two ranking points? Unfortunately, no. You only get one ranking point for completing rockets. The first rocket you complete will actually earn you that ranking point. And if for some reason that rocket becomes uncompleted during the match and there's nothing else that would give you that ranking point, you've got to get that rocket completed at the, by the end of the match in order to get that ranking point. All right, our next question. Kate, this is from Cubebag. Is the tape good enough so that the panel will not fall off inserting the cargo? Gotcha. All right. Well, I'm going to answer that a little long-winded, so bear with me. So if you just put some cargo in there, it's going to stick. But I want to point out there are these nubs that stick out in between where the hatch panels go. So if your robot were to place the panel such that you are only got a little bit of tape, right, then the panel may not stick as well. So you really want to make sure when, you put, when your robot puts the panel on there, it's centered on the hatch so that the hatch panel gets as much coverage as possible. Because the less coverage you get between the hook and loop tape, the less strong that connection is, and the more likely the cargo can escape and cause the hatch panel to fall off. But you can see, if it gets in there, if you get it right, it's pretty good. All right. Our next question wasn't really a question, but it was a request if we could demo the sandstorm. We can demo the sandstorm. So the, let me give you a little bit of an information here about what's going to happen. So I'm going to lower the sandstorm blinds like the field reset personnel will. Now, the field reset won't be here on the field. They'll be behind the field when they actually do the reset. But I'll show you the reset, and then we'll go ahead and have the, uh, the sandstorm blinds activated, and you'll see how quickly they go up. Okay? Let me hold that for you. Yeah. Oh, that's quick. That is definitely quick. That is very fast. It, we, in the, the videos, we say that it, it'll take about two seconds. In actuality, it's just under one. OK, we're back at the rocket now. A question coming in. If you put two balls in the rocket, is there a guarantee that they will go to different bays? So as you can see uh, from the rocket here, there are slant inclines inside of, inside of the rocket that allow each cargo to go a different direction. So you want to secure the hatch panel first before you put that on to guarantee that it will be secured in there when you place the game piece. As Kate will demonstrate, we'll place cargo in here with the hatch panel. It usually goes the right way if there's another cargo the other way. But no guarantees. All right, and the next question is from Andre Zors 55 and asks, can a robot hold a hatch panel and a piece of cargo at the same time? This is another place where reading the game manual is definitely going to be your best friend. In the game this year, a cargo and a hatch panel are both considered game pieces. A robot is only allowed to carry one game piece at a time, at any time during the match. So. They could only hold one cargo or one hatch panel, but not both. Indeed. Okay, we're back at the cargo ship. 
Kate, this question is, oh, it just went off the phone. Where'd it go? There it is. How much pressure is needed to secure the hatch? How much pressure is needed to secure the hatch? Well, I hate to disappoint you. I don't have a formal spec on that, but it is just pretty run of the mill, 3M hook and loop tape. So getting it pretty close, you can be pretty light touch with it and it'll stick. And you can also push really hard to make sure it's really on there, but for a pretty light touch will do it. I'm sorry that's not a more specific uh, spec, but you'll have your own pa hatch panel. You can play around with that yourself. All right, our next question comes from Darkening Flames. What is the strength needed to pull the hatch from the brush? The strength is actually quite little. It is very little. Let's go ahead and come over here and see if we can't demonstrate this just for everybody. So right now, the hatch, the hatch panel is here inside the brushes. And if I take my pinky, I can pull it off with my pinky. It is incredibly easy to come off. Now, it's not incredibly easy to come off where it'll potentially fall off during the match. You could also smash into the station lots of times, and it will not fall off. But it honestly does not take almost anything to be able to pull this off. A robot coming over here to grab it is going to be able to grab it with ease. All right, we've got a question here. We need to make one disclaimer first, Kate. What is it? I would like to make a disclaimer. So the formal official manual is the rules. Whatever we say out here, we're trying to be helpful. But if we conflict with anything in the manual, know that the manual takes precedent. Uh, and also, there are, will be a formal Q&A that opens on Wednesday. And so you can ask the, game, the whole game design committee official questions. We'll get official answers. And if anything we've said here today conflicts with that, then uh, that takes precedent as well. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. We're trying to be helpful. We're not trying to legislate. I hope that, I hope that clarifies. Yes. So we have another question. A manual oh, sorry. supersedes all. S super. OK. We have a question from Tommy the Commie. <laughs> uh, great name. Yeah. Will the tape? wear over time being removed and will it be put back all the time? I'll be honest, Tommy the Kami, I think that the tape, the loop tape on the panels is going to get, uh, yes, it's going to get damaged, it's going to get worn. I think it's probably going to, we're, we're going to see more wear and tear by, you know, metal shavings getting in there and, and kind of robots pulling on it and just the, the nature of a robotics competition is going to wear and tear it. So we'll be working with our uh, FTAs and field supervisors and field staff to keep an eye on that. And if it does get to the point where it's not sticking, we'll make sure those panels get swapped out. All right, DJ. From the Elements of Gaming asking, can you pull the panel directly from the wall or do you need to lift it up first? Yeah, actually it was a design element to be able to pull it directly from the wall. Notice that the panel is actually situated in the exact same height that it would be on the cargo ship or the lower area of the rocket. So you can actually come in and pull this thing right off the panel, literally right off the panel through the brushes without pulling up. So you pull it right off the panel and then at that height, you would then place it right onto the cargo ship or the bottom of the rocket. Sorry. All right, we're good. We have a question about can you de-score game pieces, but that's not really a field question, so we're referring you to the manual for that one. But we have another question. Can you remove score? Oh, sorry, that's that same one. There we go. What is the cutout on the cargo ship? Thanks, player. So as you can see, we have a cutout on the cargo ship. This also matches the cutout on the human player station. So design your robot accordingly to fit Dave inside life. so you can easily score a Every game challenge. piece on the cargo ship and retrieve a game piece. But be note, there is no cutout on the rocket. So as you can see, these are in these two places only, not this place. Keep that in mind when designing your robots. Our next question is from MagmaFool25. How consistent are the weight of the cargo? So the cargo is actually fairly consistent, but you have to understand that this cargo um, is not, it may not be inflated consistently. So the weight of the cargo is actually not, and what I mean by inflated consistently is that the stretch of the plastic on the ball and, and the areas that it stretches or how the, the ball is constructed may make the weight of the ball, depending on where it is on the ball, a different weight. So if you actually look at the ball, there's a, a nozzle where you actually input the air into the ball. That is actually incredibly heavier 
than the other side of the ball. So if you were to take the ball and actually roll it on the floor or bounce it, it may not actually bounce pro, you know, what you would consider a normal basketball to bounce. And you roll it, it'll actually move to the side. It is not, and it's, it's not intended to be completely weighted correctly all the way around. All right, we've got another question here, but before we get to that question, this one's about vision. There's some things that our teams can see this year online. We've got two new shows for you. We've got a new program on Twitch that's the, basically it's a first robot reveal show. That will be February 24th at 7 p.m. So first, our first channel is doing the first robot reveal we've ever done. That's on our Twitch channel. The first robot competition, robot reveal, February 24th at 7 p.m. Also new this year, live webcasting from regional events and a weekly highlight show. And that's, you can find more information at FRC Watch. All right, so we've got a new highlight show from the week's events and we've got a robot reveal show. So we're talking about vision, things to see. Here's a question. If you do not have a vision system, Malcolm, can you still attempt to drive through the sandstorm blind at the beginning of the match? So during the sandstorm period, you will have access to drive your robot around. As you, can, as you may well know, vision aids in that process. So if you would be able to do it, but it would be very difficult because you wouldn't be able to see where you're going. All right, so our next question is from David, but it's a hardcore question. Since each level of a rocket can only hold two cargoes, if there are no cargo balls in a level, can you choose which side, left or right, the cargo ball will go, or is it a 50-50 chance of whether the cargo ball will go left or right? So the mechanicals, the physics of the, the cargo ship would make it so that if the ball has absolutely no spin and you place it inside there, you're really going to have a 50-50 chance on whether that ball is going to go to the right or to the left. I'm sure some teams are going to figure out ways to allow that ball to, to go one way or the other um, by design. But just a flat ball put in, it's going to be 50-50. All right. Those are all the questions we're going to answer for now. Our teams are here field side. We want to say good luck this season. Thanks for tuning in for the kickoff. We will see you out there on the field this year. Thank you for joining in from over 146 local kickoffs across the world. Enjoy your season. Destination Deep Space, here we come. Happy kickoff.